Good morning, a warm welcome to you all. I hope you've had a good week. It's great to gather as God's people on this special day of the week. Sometimes we feel that all the days are about the same, but Sundays are special. They're special because we gather as a people of God. So let's sing our opening hymn. Sing to God new songs of worship. if it's true for you but one thing that I've definitely noticed during this lockdown period is that I'm spending an awful lot less money and it's made me realise just how many things that we buy. I can honestly say I have not bought a new article of clothing for three months and that's absolutely not like me at all. It says in the Bible that we shouldn't build bigger barns to store all our things in. But I wonder if this period in time has made us realise just how little things actually matter and just how much people actually matter. One of the things which unfortunately happened during this period was that my mother-in-law sadly died. And it's only just in this past week that the family have been able to go to the house and start to go through the things, the things that she accumulated during our life. Now, she wasn't a woman of very much wealth, but the things that she had in that house which mattered to the family were interesting. So here's some of the things that we have to remind us of her and also of her late husband, my father-in-law. They liked their music, popular cowboy favourites. One of these late nights, we'll put that on and we'll listen and we'll remember. Another of the musical treats was Sing Along with Max. That's Max Bygraves. Do you remember him looking as young as that? No, I certainly don't remember him looking as young as that either. And here's another record that we got from the house, Well-Loved Family Hymns. And if you look very closely, you can see that the price is still on it. 14 shillings and sixpence. They didn't buy that yesterday, did they? But one of the other things that we have to remind them by is this little glass. Now you might think, oh well that looks like a nice wee crystal glass. I don't think it's worth very much money. But it's important to us because along the bottom of it, it says Evening News Centenary, 1873 to 1973. 
And the reason that's important to us is because my father-in-law worked for the Evening News and the Scotsman newspaper. He was a copy reader. And so that reminds us of him. So all the things that we have, all the things that we like to accumulate, they don't really matter in times like these. And I hope and pray when we come out of the other side of this, we will remember that. We'll remember that it's not the things that we have, it's the people that we have in our lives that are that are important. The people that we have in our lives who matter. Let's come to God in prayer. Let us pray. Living God, we praise you for your love shown to us in Christ. Your love that goes on seeking us out, caring for us, guiding us, protecting us through these difficult times. And still that love comes despite our lack of love for you and our failure to live as Jesus' disciples. And so God, forgive us if we have feeble faith. Forgive us if we care so little about you or so little about others, but too much above ourselves. Forgive us for turning the Christian faith into something we receive rather than something that we share. But loving God, help us more truly to live as your people. Give us a due sense of our responsibility towards others, always remembering the poor and the sick and the lonely, the weak and the sorrowful. But help us to recognise our responsibility towards you and towards the world that you have given us, so that in everything we think and say and do, we might live for your glory and work for your kingdom. So hear us now as we pray together in the words Jesus taught, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power and the glory forever. Amen. We're going to turn now to the Word of God and our lessons this morning are going to be read by Hazel and by Ian. This morning's reading is from Romans 5 verses 1 to 8. Peace and hope. Therefore we have been justified through faith. We have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ through whom we have gained access by faith into this grace in which we now stand. And we boast in the hope of the glory of God. Not only so, but we also glory in our sufferings, because we know that suffering produces perseverance. Perseverance, character, and character, hope. And hope does not put us to shame, because God's love has been poured out into our hearts through the Holy Spirit who has been given to us. You see, at just the right time, when we were still powerless, Christ died for the ungodly. Very rarely will anyone die for a righteous person, though for a good person, someone might possibly dare to die. But God demonstrates his own love for us in this. While we were still sinners, Christ died for us. Amen. Our second reading this morning is from the Gospel according to St Matthew, Matthew chapter 9, 35 to 38, and chapter 10, verses 1 to 8. The workers are few. Jesus went through all the towns and villages, teaching in the synagogues, proclaiming the good news of the kingdom and healing every disease and illness. When he saw the crowds, he had compassion on them, because they were harassed and helpless, like sheep without a shepherd. Then he said to his disciples, the harvest is plentiful, but the workers are few. Ask the Lord of the harvest, therefore, to send out workers into his harvest field. And now from Matthew chapter 10, verses 1 to 8, Jesus sends out the twelve. Jesus called his twelve disciples to him and gave him authority to drive out impure spirits and to heal every disease and illness. These are the names of the twelve apostles. First, Simon who is called Peter, and his brother Andrew, James, son of Zebedee, and his brother John, Philip and Bartholomew, Thomas and Matthew, the tax collector, James, son of Alphaeus, and Thaddeus, Simon, 
the zealot, and Judas Iscariot, who betrayed him. These twelve Jesus sent out with the following instructions. Do not go among the Gentiles or enter any town of the Samaritans. Go rather to the lost sheep of Israel. As you go, proclaim this message. The kingdom of heaven has come near. Heal those who are ill, raise the dead, cleanse those who have leprosy, drive out demons, freely you have received, so freely give. May God add his thanks to these readings of his holy word, and now we sing the wonderful song, Amazing Grace. May the words of my mouth and the meditation of all our hearts be pleasing in your sight, O Lord, our Rock and our Redeemer. One of the subjects that I did at university last year was a subject called Pauline Theology. It was a study of various letters from Paul to the Christian churches in Rome, Corinth, Galatia, Ephesus and so on. It was a fascinating subject, but our main concentration was in Paul's letter to the Romans, the first of our scripture lessons this morning. The letter was written because there were tensions in Rome between the Jewish and the Gentile Christians. And the purpose for Paul's letter was to unite the church and to roadmap how Christians should live their lives, highlighting that both Jews and Gentiles fit equally into God's plan. Now this letter could be argued as being the letter that changed lives. Saint Augustine was converted through Paul's letter to the Romans in AD 386. But it was about 1100 years later when a German monk named Martin Luther had a revelation. 
Martin was teaching Paul's letter to the Romans to a bunch of students when the truth suddenly dawned on him. He realised that God's righteousness is not something that we achieve by our own efforts, but it's something that God gives to us freely, gracefully and mercifully in response to our faith. And that's when he began to understand and teach justification by faith. Luther called Paul's letter to the Romans the chief part of the New Testament. And it was from Martin Luther's teachings based on Paul's letter to the Romans that the reformation of the church began. Paul tells us God's love has been poured into our hearts through the Holy Spirit who has been given to us. Paul started out a powerful and evil man, a former persecutor of Christian believers, whose life was completely changed when God intervened by humbling him on the road to Damascus. In the process, he lost his sight, but it was later restored and he was filled with the Holy Spirit. And if you want to read about Paul's conversion, you can find it in Acts chapter 9. But when Paul fully understood the meaning of forgiveness, he did nothing to deserve God's gift of love and forgiveness, but he knew that to receive the Holy Spirit was only by the grace of God. And since Paul experienced God's gift of love freely, he wants us to experience it in the same way. No catch, no fine print, no bottom line, no strings attached. God's gift of love is totally free. I came across a wee story and I make no apology if you've heard it before, because it's a good illustration of the equality of God's love for all of us. A school teacher was registering two new students who were sisters, and she asked for their ages and respective dates of birth. One of the sisters says, we're both seven. My birthday's April the 8th, and my sister's is April the 20th. And the teacher replied, surely that can't be possible. And the other sister replied, no, it's true. One of us is adopted. Oh, said the teacher, which one? The two sisters looked at each other. And then the first one said, we asked our parents that same question a long time ago. And they said that they couldn't remember because it didn't matter. They loved us both the same. So using the words of the song that I quoted last week, whether we're red, brown, yellow, black or white, Jew or Gentile, God loves us all equally, having poured his Holy Spirit into all our hearts freely and gracefully. Last week in our gospel lesson, we had the Great Commission, whereby Jesus sent out his disciples to go and make disciples of all nations, baptising them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit teaching them to obey everything that Jesus had commanded them to do so. For the astute mathematicians amongst you, here's a calculation to get your head around. And I need you to stick with me on this one. I need you to follow my logic and hopefully you'll see where I'm getting to with this. I want you to picture a stadium that holds about 50,000 people. For example, Hamden. Hamden Park holds, according to their website, 51,866 people. So picture Hamden. The current world population is roughly about 7.85 billion people. And obviously that changes all the time as people are born and people die every other second. But this is where I need you to imagine and to use your imagination. If we had an evangelist parked in Hamden Park every night, with everyone in the world going in and out, hearing the message about the love of God, bearing in mind that Hamden holds about 51,866, it would take the evangelist 
151,257 nights to tell everyone about the love of God. And that equates to 414 years without a night off. The sad part of the story is that not everyone would be reached. Because in the example, I've assumed that no one died in that 414 years. But people would be born. So it would still take more years to reach everyone. And obviously it's an extreme example and it may seem a crazy scenario. But is it? By comparison, if one person told one person about the love of God, then there would be two people who knew about God's love. And if on the next day, those two people told another two people, then there would be four people. And if on the next day, those four people told another four people, then there would be eight. And on the next day, if these eight told another eight, there would be 16 and so on and so on. And by the power of mathematics, in 33 days, yes, 33 days, not 414 years, 33 days, then approximately 8.6 billion people would know about God's love. So I want you to park that mathematical statistic for the moment. Right at the beginning of this morning's gospel passage, we are told that Jesus went through the towns and the villages teaching and healing and showing compassion. And he refers to the crowds as a sheep without a shepherd. In Matthew chapter 8 and chapter 9, it has many examples where Jesus travelled about teaching and healing. For example, he cured a man with leprosy. He restored to health two demon-possessed men. He cured a paralysed man. He gave sight to a blind man. And he allowed a mute to speak. And in most of these examples, he used the words, You are forgiven and your faith has made you well. So when we hear Jesus telling us that the harvest is plentiful, but the workers are few, what Jesus is really saying is that there are many, many people out there who still need to know about the love of God. And basically, there's not enough workers to go out and relay that message. So at the beginning of chapter 10, 12, di 12 disciples are named and Jesus tells them where to go, what to do and what to say. He reminds them that they have freely received, so they must freely give. Now, Anne mentioned last week that I always like to mention a song. So I hope I'm not getting predictable here, but I couldn't help myself um, this week. So the song that I would like to quote from this week is all power is given in Jesus' name, in earth and heaven in Jesus' name. And in Jesus' name, I come to you to share his power. As he told me to, he said, freely, freely, you have received, freely, freely give. Go in my name and because you believe, others will know that I live. So let's pick up that mathematical statistic again. If each one of us freely passed on the message of God's love and the power of the Holy Spirit to one other person, and we could convince that one other person to allow God to come into their life, to change it, and then share that message with one other person, just think, how many workers could you recruit? How many workers could we recruit? I'll leave that thought with you. And may God bless to each one of us the preaching and the understanding of his most holy word. Amen. Once again, let's come to God in prayer. Let us pray. 
Lord God, in long summer evenings, when the light lingers and when the sunsets have time to deepen from light pink to deep red, we offer you our thanks and praise. And yet we remember and hold before you today the people in our world where the fading of the light brings not only darkness, but sadness and discomfort and loneliness. May they know your light to shine in their lives. And Lord, when we gather and share food and laughter with friends and relatives, even when we do it in a virtual way, also when we're content to just eat alone, we offer you our thanks and praise. But we remember and hold before you those who today will share meals that are tainted with sadness. Those through no choice of their own have to eat alone. And Lord, we remember those who are hungry and have little food. Lord, we pray that they may soon know joy and plenty. And so, Lord, when we've been offered friendship and hospitality, that person who stops and speaks to us when we're out on our walk, we offer you our thanks, we offer you our praise. But we remember and hold before you people who know nothing of hospitality, people who are strangers in a foreign land, those for whom exceptional warmth and hospitality would mean so much. Lord, we pray that they may know a rich welcome and ongoing support. Lord, you know the difficult times in which we live. You know the concerns that we have for ourselves and the concerns we have for those we love. And we know that we can bring them to you in confidence and lay them at your feet, trusting in your goodness. And so ever creating, ever loving and ever encouraging God, we offer you our deep thanks. And we ask that you will use our talents, our gifts and our skills in the world so that our lives may tell out your praise and where possible aid those whom we have remembered before you this day. And so, Lord, hear our prayers through Jesus Christ, our loving Saviour. Amen. A closing hymn this morning is To God Be the Glory, Great Things He Has Done.
And now, may the God of grace forgive you. May the Lord of creation remake you. And may the ruler of history direct your paths. And may the blessings of God Almighty, Father, Son and Holy Spirit be with us all now and forevermore. Amen. Once again, thanks for joining with us this morning. I hope you have a good week to come. And remember, if you want to join us for a coffee, just make your own coffee, go on to Zoom, and we'll be there from quarter to 12 until quarter to one. And we'd love to see you there.